Hey, welcome to First Baptist Church East Merced's Bible Studies for Life Sunday School Lesson for the week of November the 15th. I sure appreciate that you are faithful to join us each week and watch the Sunday School Lesson. We're continuing our series this week, All In, A Life of Commitment, uh, of Following Jesus. And today we're going to be talking about a commitment to prayer. I want to remind you, you can go back on our YouTube channel and you can check out and get all the lessons that... Uh, have led up to week five of this series and on our website at fbceb.org slash Sunday School, you can download this week's lesson guide. It helps you to study and follow along, gives you a resource uh, that can help you as you grow and, and learn and, and look at God's Word. So if you'll check out our website, get that study guide, uh, it gives you an opportunity later in the week, and also you can go back and check out any of the lessons uh, in this series. But we're in week number five, uh, November, for November the 15th, all in a life of commitment, and today we're going to be talking about prayer uh, from Colossians chapter 1. So I hope you grab your Bible, and we'll get started uh, in just a second. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for your word and for its instruction to our life. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand it, uh, and as we uh, look at it, that, God, you would help us to be committed to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, how would you like to pick up your phone and the president would answer. Well, that's not exactly, that's exactly what it was like in 1893 when the very first phone was put into the White House. When you would call the line, Grover Cleveland, the President of the United States, would answer the phone. <laughs> Long gone are the, those days. But you know, it's not the case with God. Prayer is a direct line to the sovereign, all-powerful creator of the universe that invites us to share our burdens, our concerns, and he asks us into this relationship of prayer. In the book of Colossians, Paul begins his letter to uh, encourage these believers with a lifestyle of prayer, and he gives us a very good, clear model for us to follow. I want you to know that as Paul, as we begin this letter, Paul is in prison when he writes this letter, and he has heard that there are some false teachers who are adding to the gospel. They're trying to deceive the believers at Colossae into believing that Jesus is not enough, that they need more than Jesus, or they need to add or go back to the past way of celebrating Jewish festivals and feasts, and they need those things uh, to really be pleasing to God. But what Paul teaches and what Paul explains to them in this letter is that Christ is enough. That we need, need Jesus, but he is all we need. And so Paul begins this letter with a grateful prayer of what God has done and is doing in the life of these believers. And it gives us a really good model. It really gives us a call, call crystal, crystal clear call to pray for one another. Paul's example is going to show us how important, really, prayer is in the life of our church. You, you know, one of the things that we tend to do is that we look at prayer as only when, we're, when it's urgent, only when we have a crisis, or only when we have a need. Well, Paul's going to show us in this, this letter, in these opening verses, how that we need to be daily praying for one another, how that we can pray that God would be uh, working in each other's lives so that his glory would be felt and seen in the world. And so, Paul, Paul opens the letter in verse 3 is where we're going to start today. We're going to read uh, for, through t verse 12. Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit, growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned it. You learned this from Epaphras, our Dearly loved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love 
in the Spirit. Now that's verses 3 through 8. And so let's let's look at what Paul wants us to see and some of the things that we get here. He Paul says in verse 3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And as we look at today's lesson, one of the things that we understand, the big idea, is that we are to be committed to pray for sal- the salvation and spiritual growth of others. That's what he's praying in this letter. He's praying for these believers' spiritual growth. He's praying for their lives to resemble Jesus, to look like him, to follow Christ in such a way that they grow more and more like Jesus every single day of their life. He's praying for their spiritual growth. But he also teaches that we ought to pray for others and those who serve and those who share the gospel. And so we're going to learn that as we go through this prayer together. Paul says that we ought to first pray with thanksgiving for other believers. That's one of the things that he teaches us in this lesson. We always thank God. You can circle or underline that in your, in your Bible. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Paul is giving us a one-line encouragement that we ought to value and see the importance of praying for each other. Paul uses the word always and when we pray and he is calling the church to be reminded that this is an important thing daily in our lives, that we are to be committed to spending time in prayer for one another. Paul says we thank God for you. Paul says we ought to be thankful for other believers in our lives. He said, we thank, we th- we're thankful because when we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, and because of this, the hope reserved in heaven for you, you have already heard about this hope in the gospel, the word of truth that's come to you. It's bearing fruit growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to appreciate appreciate God's grace. Paul says, here's what I'm thankful for. He said, it's evident that God has worked in your life and is continuing to do so. He says, we've, we've heard about your faith in Christ and how that that faith has changed you and caused you to love one another and that you've placed your hope completely in him in a hope that's reserved only in the gospel in heaven for you. Paul says, here's what we're thankful for. We're thankful for the work that the gospel of Jesus Christ is doing in your life. Because he says in verse 6, it's come to them, it's come to us, and it's bearing fruit. That they, you can see it. It's evident of what God uh, is doing in their life. There's evidence of it. And it's also growing. It's growing all over the world. That's what the gospel does. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed, whenever truth is shared about who Jesus is, it bears fruit. Believers come to know Christ, or they come to believe, people come to believe in Christ. And it grows. They grow and the gospel spreads. It's what the gospel does. We need to have confidence in the gospel. A lot of times today, we we don't have the confidence to share the gospel with somebody. We're we're afraid or we we don't know what they're going to say to us. Or maybe we're afraid of rejection. But here's the thing about the gospel. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed, it does bear fruit. We've seen it in our own lives, and we see it in one another. Paul says, I am thankful for you. We always thank God when we pray for you. A couple of things that that I want you to do or just to pay attention to in your lesson guide or in your Bible or on a piece of paper is that you say, Paul says, we always thank God for you. Paul is very specific He's very specific. Not only is he thankful for the work that God has done in their life, he's thankful for them individually. While the word you here is plural, and we can be thankful and grateful for our church, and and, and we should be. I think Paul is thinking about individual lives that have been transformed by the gospel. And he's calling us to be thankful for people in our lives who show us an an example of following Jesus. Who's someone you're thankful for today? Maybe it's the person who introduced you to Christ or shared the gospel with you. Maybe it's that Sunday school teacher who helped you to grow and know more or gave you that hunger or desire to grow, to know Jesus more. Maybe it's a, a, a 
pastor who preached the gospel faithfully to you and you came to know Christ and, and you grew under that pastor's, who's someone you're thankful for? Maybe it was your parents who shared the gospel with you and brought you to a place where you hungered for uh, to know Christ as your Savior. Maybe, maybe, who, maybe, maybe it's that person that sits across the, the church from you who you've seen year after year after year demonstrate the faithfulness of following Jesus, who have been an example for you. Who's someone you are thankful for? You know, when I looked at this lesson to, to get ready for uh, teaching here, uh, one of the things that I am grateful for is you. Um, the, the encouragement particularly from about the end of July, August, September, and October that I have experienced personally from the church has, has been incredible. Uh, to, to know that during this season of difficulty and stress and worry and anxiety, all of those things, you guys have been encouragers. You guys have been the people who have prayed. You, you guys are the people who are bearing fruit to the gospel. You guys are the ones that when I stop to thank God for, I'm thankful for our church. I mean, I've told several people recently that I love First Baptist Church East Bernstead. And when I mean that, I, I'm not talking about the, the brick and mortar as much as I love the building and, and, and the way it looks and the campus that we have. I'm, I'm talking about our church family. I love gathering together and worship. I love seeing everybody. I, I love the, the encouragement that I get when I see comments on a video or uh, somebody sends me a text message because they watched an online service. I'm grateful and thankful for those who have been faithful to watch and engage online for months and months and months uh, in, in this time of, of difficulty and pandemic. We, we, we should be grateful and be thankful for those in our lives that we see the fruit of the gospel in. Who's someone you can be thankful for? Maybe put this story in the comments below or maybe send me a text. I'll, I'll put the text number in the comments and you, you can send that, you can share that with me. Who's someone in your life that has demonstrated the fruit of the gospel that you're thankful for? That's what Paul says. We always thank God when we pray for you. Now, I also would encourage you to stop. And that person that you're thankful for, pray. Maybe push pause, take some time and say, God, I really thank you for, and then let them know. Just send them a message. Send them a, a card in the mail. Just, just let them know. Say, I am very thankful for you. I am thankful because of the hope that you have expressed. I have seen your faith and seen how it bears fruit in your life. And it has been an encouragement to me. Thank you. You know, that's one of the things that Paul teaches us here in the importance of this prayer. I always thank God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. I think Paul wants us to understand that we should be grateful for the work of God that's going on in our lives, in one another, in our church family. And that's what Paul is helping us to understand. Church is encouraging. Our church family is there for us. It's one of the things that we learn in this text. The second thing that Paul teaches us is we ought to pray for those who share and minister the gospel. You know, he says here, he says, verse 6, that, it's, that this gospel has come to you. It's bearing fruit, growing all over the world as it is among you since the day you heard it came to appreciate God's grace. You learn this from Epaphras, our dearly fellow servant. He is a faithful minister on, of Christ on your behalf. And he has told us about your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras had brought a message from the church at Colossae to Paul, and he brought a report. He had said, this is what God is doing in their lives. Not only is the gospel changing their lives and it's bearing fruit, it's also spreading and it's going out to other people. Now, Colossae is not the church or the city like Ephesus or even Philippi, an influential city. Colossae is probably one of the least influential cities that Paul write, actually writes a letter to. But it helps us understand the importance all of us play in the sharing and the growing of the gospel. That Epaphras comes and he says, this is what the gospel's doing in these people's lives. This is what the gospel is doing as they share and spread the gospel. And so Paul encourages this church to pray. He says, you learned this from Epaphras, our dearly fellow servant. He is a 
faithful minister on your behalf, and he has reported about your love in the Spirit. Listen, one of the things that we, we learn to do is to pray for people who spread and share the gospel. You know, I know it's going to come to your mind. The first thing that, about this is that you ought to pray for those, and particularly our church staff. Who, who are sharing the gospel, who are leading the church, who uh, are leading the charge into the community and to see the gospel grow and bear fruit in our lives and all around the world. But I want to encourage you to think a little more broad. Think about missions and, and people like um, the uh, William and Heidi Hahn who are here in December. feels like it's been a long time ago. Who minister in northern Ghana. Who uh, live on a medical campus and, and do, do ministry through a hospital. Or Bob and Bonnie, who work with boys and girls, almost 20,000 boys and girls in Bible clubs all around the, the country of Ghana, sharing the gospel. In, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be giving you a prayer guide. It, it's for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's the, the week of prayer begins on November 29th. And so here's an opportunity for you to stop every single day and pray for the spreading and bearing fruit of the gospel in people's lives who are out there on the front line sharing the gospel. And while we're doing that, we ought to pray that God would raise up others, that we would see people in our church come to not to just a place of surrender to God in, in doing his service, but, but we would see God call preachers, or we would see God call missionaries, or we would see God call church planners, or we would see God call new Sunday school leaders and new people who are going to rise up and minister and spread the gospel. Listen, how can you pray for the spread of the gospel? You, you begin by praying for individuals who share the gospel. There are lots and lots of ways, lots and lots of opportunities for you to pray for people who spread the gospel. Jonathan Jamie Woodyard in Indiana and Minnesota who are planting churches to share and spread the gospel. For Tommy Tapscott, who is uh, now our associational uh, missional strategist. He is our director of missions who in this area leads churches to make disciples and, and insist those churches to do that. And so there's a way to pray and be involved in the spread and the bearing fruit of the gospel. Paul, Paul is thankful for them, and he says we should be, be pray with thanksgiving for one another, but he says we ought to pray for the gospel to do its work, that it ought to bear fruit and grow all over the world. And people like Epaphras, who are faithful to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to pray for them. We're dependent on your prayers. I'm dependent on your prayers. Your prayers encourage me. It's helpful when I get a text that somebody says, hey, I'm just praying for you today. Uh, or reminded on a Sunday, hey, pray for the service today. You, you know, what if we get to heaven and if it's found out that it was not a crafty sermon or a great, great speaker or a dynamic day uh, of worship when the pastor was really on, but it was the prayers of the people that saw people come, other people come to know Jesus? What if people coming to know Christ depended on your and my prayers every single week? Let's pray that our church, beginning in our church, would be a church and a people, a group of people who will spread and share the gospel so that it might bear fruit in our lives and grow all over the world. It's a great opportunity for us. And when we give you that prayer guide on November the 29th, take that home. We're going to publish it online. We're going to make it available for, for folks. Take that prayer guide home and pray for the spread of of the gospel. So Paul says, pray with thanksgiving. Pray for those who share and spread the gospel. And then he says, pray for the spiritual growth in believers' lives. That's the last part of these verses that we're going to look at today. It's verses 9 through 12. Paul says, for this reason also, since the day we heard this, we have not stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. Listen, Paul gives us these, in these, these three verses. Paul gives us, and a good outline 
for how to pray for one another. Now, he said, be thankful for one another. He said that, be thankful for you. I'm thankful for you. Be praying for the spread and the, the people who minister the gospel and pray for the spread and the growth of the gospel. But he also says, here's how to pray for one another. He says, pray for the spiritual growth. This is the third thing. Pray for spiritual growth of believers. Pray that what? What do we pray for one another? What would we pray as we give thanks? What should we pray for each other at church? Paul gives four things. He says, pray, uh, he says, for this reason also, since the day we've heard it, the report, we haven't stopped praying for you. So Paul's going to give us the example, and he says, we are asking that, number one, you be filled with the knowledge of his will, God's will. Listen, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Paul says here that the first thing that we ought to pray for is for believers and for us, one another, to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Now, you can be filled with a lot of things. You can be filled with anger. You can be filled with bitterness. You can be filled with unforgiveness. But Paul says to be filled with God's will. It's the idea is that we're to be surrendered to the will of God in our life. We're to be controlled by it. And even a better illustration or a better wording might be that we be under the influence of. Paul says we want you to be under the influence of God's will and purpose in your life that you would surrender your life to be influenced by the Word of God every single day, that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and wisdom and spiritual understanding. Well, how do you know the will of God, Pastor? You know it by studying His Word. You know it by spending time thinking about praying and, 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 and meditating on the Word. And so that is the will of God in our life. And so we surrender our lives to the will and be influenced by the direction that He gives us in His Word. Now, God's will for your life will never be separated from his word. You can't say that God, God, God says this and I, can, I feel like I can do this. That's contrary to what he says in his word. So if his word reveals something to us, then, then we should surrender ourselves to it and obey it and submit it and, and be influenced by it. And as we do, we're surrendered and influenced and filled with the will and knowledge of God and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And the reason that Paul says, and he says, be filled with the knowledge of his will, is that we might live lives, the second thing, is that we might live lives worthy of and pleasing to Christ. Verse 10, he says, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. So what Paul says here, he says it's not enough just to have the word input in, input into our lives. There is an output put of the word that is produced in our lives so that you might walk worthy. He's saying so that we might have a lifestyle that demonstrates our that's more than just knowing. For a lot of times, a lot of us, a lot of times we think that it's just about knowing more about God. Or knowing uh, God's word, that discipleship or following God is just knowing the facts. But here's the thing God's word, God's will, when we understand it, dramatically impacts and changes our lives. And so Paul says that we might live lives, lives that are examples, that are worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him, that bear fruit and grow more and more in the knowledge of His will. And he says, so knowing God's word and knowing God's will leads to living God's word and God's will. He says it's going to be a life, ch life change in our life. So we're going to be, what does Paul pray? He says, let's be pr pray that we would be filled with the knowledge of God's will that we might live lives worthy of and pleasing to Christ so that we might bear fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Now listen, verse 11 says, he gives us the third thing. He says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you might have great endurance. Third thing that he prays for is that we might be strengthened so that we can endure. You know, I talked about this this past Sunday here at church about how it feels like sometimes that, that this particular this year, this 2020, has felt just like enduring. That's been one step right after the other. It's difficult. But endurance really is trusting God enough to take the next, next step, even though we don't know where it's going. That's just trusting enough and being strengthened by Him that we might take that next step. That we be strengthened with what all power, the word there is the, the, the 
dunamis or the dynamite or the power of the resurrection, that we might be strengthened by the resurrection of Christ according to his glorious might so that we might have great endurance. And so Paul says, here's what you are to pray for one another, that each other would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that means surrender to you and to follow his word in our life, that we might be influenced by it, that it would influence so that we would live lives worthy of the gospel, pleasing to God, that we might bear fruit for Christ, that our lives would be, what, changed, that we would endure even difficulty because we have been strengthened by that nourishment, by that encouragement of his word, and our endurance gives a light to our path that brings a strength to us from God himself. So you might have great endurance and patience. And then the fourth thing that he says that we ought to joyfully give thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He says we ought to joyfully give thanks to God. So Paul says that the result of this prayer is that we would be thankful and rejoice with one another. So here's what Paul says that we're to pray. We're to pray that we're to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, that we're to live lives worthy of and pleasing to Christ, that we're to be strengthened by him so that we might endure and that we should give joyful thanksgiving to God. What a prayer for the church. You could take verses 9 through 12 and just outline that and pray every single day for one another. Listen, you can pray for me, you can pray for my family, you can pray for your family. Listen, I would encourage you to pray for your wives, pray for your husbands, husbands, pray for your wives. Let's, let's be people who will, will see that prayer is an opportunity to speak to the Lord on the behalf of somebody else, and he is listening. He invites us into this, and he gives us an opportunity to be thankful for one another, to pray for those who share and spread the gospel, that the gospel does its work, but he says, be filled. Pray for spiritual growth. Pray that people might be filled with the knowledge of will live lives worthy of love and pleasing to Christ and fully strengthened by God giving joyfully thanks giving to God let's be a people of prayer so who can you pray for today I mean who can I pray for you how can I pray for you but I am going to pray that those who listen those who are studying God's word today will be these four things let's pray together Lord I pray today that those who are listening and studying your word would be filled with the knowledge of your will, that they would be influenced by it, that they would be, uh, Lord, surrendered to it. I pray that that surrendering and that knowledge that you give us through your word would lead to lives that are changed, and lives that live worthy of who you are and pleasing to Christ. Let us honor you in all of our actions because we are surrendered and influenced by your word and your will. Lord, would you strengthen us? This season has been difficult. It's, it's a time where we need to endure. And Lord, it gets tiring. Help us, Lord, to be strengthened. And as we lean in and we lean on you, Lord, and you strengthen us by your mighty power, let us joyfully give thanks to who you are and for what you're doing in our lives around us. God, I pray that those who are listening would feel these things in their life. God, we're grateful for the people in our lives. We're thankful for folks that go to church with us, who encourage us, who love us. Lord, we always thank God. We thank you, Father, for those who you've given as our church family. God, may our church family grow and, and produce fruit, bear fruit, for the goodness of the gospel all over the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for being with me today. I, I pray that it's been a great opportunity uh, for you in your life, and I hope to see you again next week.